we thank God for His faithfulness and His goodness and the promise that we just sang about that it's a declaration not just for those here in the building but for our online family and those in the video experience. Before you take a seat, I want us to cheer so loud and welcome those who are part of our online family who watch live and also during the week. So can we welcome them to the Father's house as well? We are so honored and excited that we get to open up and dive into God's Word together. You guys can go ahead and greet your neighbor and go ahead and grab a seat to get this party started. Woo, family, you picked a good week, a good week to be in the house of God. Let me tell you something. We are about to dive, deep dive into a conversation about love, sex, dating, and relationships. In fact, we are kicking off a new series entitled Rated R, Romance, Religion, and Relationships. I'll be honest with you, um, as we lay out the, the spiritual diet, if you will, for the year, we think about our series. Well, what our series? Series are our way of communicating truths through God's word to his people. And there's two series. I love all of our series, but there's two series that I'm very precious with. I, I care a lot about. The first one is when we teach out of a book of the Bible, whether verse by verse or chapter by chapter. I'm passionate about that because at my core, I'm a word nerd. I love me some Bible. And this big topic and discussion of like, hey, how are we discipling people? You know how I disciple people? By expounding on the word of God. It's how I love God's people well. And then the second series that I love so much is our relationship series. Well, why is that? Why am I so passionate about our relationship series? Well, we have a God who is passionate about healthy relationships. Amen. We have a very relational God. And if God wants healthy relationships for us, then that's what I want for God's people. In fact, if I get to the end of my life and these two things were not said about me, I think it would be a miss. I see most of us, we could acquire millions. We could acquire influence. We can acquire fame. But that stuff doesn't matter to me. I've been thinking long and hard about legacy the last two weeks of my life. And what I want to be said about me, what I want to be said about my relationships is she loved God so well and she loved her people really well. That's what I want for my life and that's what I want for this house. I want us to learn how to do relationships well. And so if we serve a relational God and God cares about relationships, why are relationships so hard? Okay, some of y'all got real tight booty and be like, if I laugh, then everyone's gonna know I have dysfunctional relationships. It's okay, we all do. And you could sit here with the facade and be very Orange County and just be like, no, everything's fine. But the truth of the matter is, is that 51% of marriages will end in divorce. And the statistic doesn't change for Christian or non-Christian. When we talk about healthy relationships, you know that the number one issue and request that come in for pastoral counseling and care is relational issues. When we talk about relationships, we have so much baggage that we enter in dating relationships and marriage relationships that we kind of don't know how to engage with other people. We want to have friends and we want to be good friends, but why are we in working relationships or friendships and we're saying words, but we're not communicating our need? Relationships are hard. And here's the truth. Since the beginning of the fall of humanity, uh, scripture will tell us in the Garden of Eden, but since the beginning of humanity, you know what has been revealed about the nature of humans? My God, we are selfish. We are self-centered and we hate sacrifice. I hope you did not bring your good shoes today because I'm about to step on some toes, all right? That's the truth. In this series, my goal, my heart, the, the aim, the ambition, and the vision of this series is that we just get better at doing relationships. Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you do better. I want us to know better. How many of you at show of hands want to do relationships better? How many want to learn how to date better? How many, if y'all married, you better keep your hand up for that one too, okay? Date your spouse, all right? How many want better marriages and better friendships? Yes, that's why we are passionate that we dedicate every year to this conversation. What I realized is that relationships and romance could feel like a tug of war. As I was preparing for the series, I just see like a rope. If you remember that childhood game where there would be two opposing teams and they would each be pulling each side to the other. And I feel like in relationships, we're in a tug of war. We're pulling for power with our spouse. We're pulling for power with our work relationships. We're pulling for power in our friendships. And if we, we, we feel like and fear, if I let go of the rope, if I let go of control, then I'm letting go of the leverage that I have to control my life. Now, the, the, the interesting thing 
is do you know that concept is opposite for what everything that Jesus says? That is not the message of Jesus. In fact, it's antithetical. That's an SAT word right there for you. You're welcome, all right? Raising your IQ emotionally and verbally. It is the antithesis of what Jesus came to this world to do. Let me back this up a little bit of scripture. Matthew 5, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The ex who left you, the person who broke your heart, pray for them. If you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Look at what Jesus says in John 13, love one another as I have loved you. <laughs> you better love one another. Oh, that person that drives you crazy at church, when you see them, you just want to walk in the opposite direction. That person, when you're scrolling on social media, when you see their posts, it makes you cringe. Yeah, love them because that's what Jesus said to do. What about John 15? Greater love has no one than this, than one who lays his life down for his friends. You want to have friends? It's going to require sacrifice. Jesus says in Matthew 22, love your neighbor as you love yourself. You think of yourself first. You think of your meal, your car fee, your parking spot, your finances, your time, your relationship. Guess what? You're going to have to think about your spouse, your friend, your neighbor, and those in your community group on the same level as you. So the words of Jesus I'm asking, is that what the world is telling us? No. We are getting a polar opposite message. So over the next six weeks, what we want to do is we want to unpack a book of the Bible uh, that, that might feel like you might be triggered at certain moments. But I hope it triggers us to change and to morph and to mold into who Jesus wants us to be. So if you're single in here, this is what I'm, 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 I'm hoping and believing for, is that by looking at a, a, a relationship in an ancient text, that it almost illuminates and shed lights in our lives, that you begin to ask questions. Should I be in a relationship? Do I want to be married? See, when was the last time you heard an entire church that was dedicated to not getting married? Because Paul said in scripture very clearly, my desire for you is to remain single so that you'll be able to spend time developing yourselves to the work and the glory of God. I want us to take a look at relationships in the light of scripture and begin asking questions like, what is it that I want in a mate? Am I the person that I want to be to be in a relationship? What's my worth? What's my value? If you're married in here, I believe that this book will show us how to rekindle love and romance, whether you've been married for a month or a decade or a couple decades. Uh, my, my heart and my hope is at the end of this series that married folk, we see sanctified sex as the best sex that's out there, okay? I want married folk to begin to invest in their marriages with the view of compound relational interest, okay? I want to put money into my re relational money into my relationship with Matthew that when I get to the end of my life, I'm a love millionaire. That's what I want. That's the way I want us to view relationships and love. I think even uh, relationally, whether through friends or coworkers, we got to deal with conflict and conflict resolution. How do I talk to my friends and my family when we disagree? What happens when I got beef with the coworker and I got to handle this business? Do you know that two chapters of the book that we're about to go in on is 25% of the book is about conflict and arguing. That is some good news for my marriage because sometimes I think, are we the only ones that fight? Man, so by now I hope you are asking, well, what book are we about to go in on? Wow, get your notebooks, your pens, and your Bibles out and turn with me to SOS, Song of Songs. Now, as you grab your Bibles and your notebooks, I want you to, you might have to go to the concordance or the table of contents. It's all good. We'll be with you. Take your time. But when I told Matthew as I laid out this series, I said, I know we're going to teach on Song of Songs. And I quote, this is what he said. I would rather teach on Leviticus than Song of Songs. So if we ever teach on Leviticus, guess who is teaching that entire book? Matthew Ray Oltoff, not me, all right? But the reason why he said this, he said, B, when was the last time you heard anyone reading that book? It's a book of poetry. And I said, oh, baby, it's a grown folk affair. I've been wanting to teach this book for three years. And you've been with us in the beginning of TFHOC. We've always done a relationship series. But now I feel like we have been discipling you. We've been investing in you. Now you are mature. You put your big girl pants on, your big boy pants on. Because we are going to have an introduction today, an appetizer of sorts. And the title of today's message is, Let's Get It On. Yes. The truth is, uh, Song of Songs isn't a perfect book that's going to fix all of our relational woes. 
But I do believe that as we navigate this book, I believe that this book is going to give us practical handles to navigate our life and hard and challenging conversations that you get to have with community. The challenge with doing a relationship series is that if you take anything out of context, it could jack up a lot of people. If you take one thing that I say without the context of the series or understanding that we're pulling out principles from a narrative out of the Old Testament, it can mess you up. So I'm asking you, will you invest over the next couple weeks to be in this series as we build upon principles and learn through the lives, the time, the romance, and the marriage of a couple who stayed committed? Talking about relationships is kind of like uh, one of those pharmaceutical drug commercials where there is a happy, frolicking couple, happy, whole, and, and healthy running through the fields, and the ad is like, if you take this medicine, all of your sickness will go away. And then the last three seconds of the ads are like, uh, be careful when you take this drug because it might cause heart palpitations and stroke sensitivity to light, falling hair, weight gain, and possible death. That's the way I feel like teaching a relationship series is. We've got to remember that context is everything and conversations around dating and relationships could feel just like this. So as we unpack this book, I pray that you don't do this alone, that there's some practical handles in these Sunday sermons, but in your, in your community groups that you have wisdom to go through the word of God to help you unpack this. And so when it comes to conversations about love, sex, dating, and relationships, you have been educated. You've been educated in one or two ways. Maybe you've been educated both ways. Before we open up and dive into the pages of scripture, I think it's important for us to recognize our different modes of education and miseducation. For the note takers, the, the first one is the world's view, the world's view of sex, dating, and relationships. Now, I'm going to grossly oversimplify this, and I know it's risky, but how I'm pulling out and distilling this education is from magazines, movies, medias. How the world will educate people on the topic of sex is that sex is an exploratory conquest to claim and pilfer as much bodily property as possible. That's the message of the world. I mean, let's back this up. Look at the empire, bachelor and bachelorette. What about music from Doja Cat to Zane? Uh, bodies are commodities, so like, get yours. Now is the time to sow your wild oats. And let's talk about in movies. Have you noticed? The education of sex in movies is that it's easy, seamless, clean, and perfectly timed. That's how all sexual encounters should be. No, 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 no. And we are being communicated that sex is without guilt, shame, or consequences. That's the world's education of sex. Well, what about the world's education of dating? <laughs> this is where it gets a little crazy. See, dating and the word dating is left intentionally ambiguous so that no one can really define it, and you can move in and out of relationships without any guilt or sticky fingers. Oh, oh, did they hook up? What does hook up mean? Oh, are they dating? What does dating mean? Are they shacking up? Well, what, is, what do you constitute for shacking up? See, the concept of dating feels very confusing, but the concept of sleeping one, with someone feels really easy. It's a means to an end, period. What about the world's educational view of marriage? If you look at modern media, Marriage is displayed as something antiquated. And when you get tired or the shoe don't fit no more, guess what? You could quit and walk out. Yeah. Marriage is portrayed as boring and dry and sexless. Marriage, when portrayed in media, lacks intimacy and is exhausting when it comes to conflict resolution. And we develop language that we've pilfered from media. We grew apart. We fell out of love. We no longer know each other. Do you know, according to psychological research, uh, sex expert Dr. Esther Perel, I'm a big fan of her podcast, and she said that we as humans, we change and adapt every seven to ten years. So if you've been married for 20 years, it is in essence that you have dated and been married to two very different people. If you don't learn how to get dating right before you get married, how will you be able to date your mate later on in life? So if your education was a world's view, your world standpoint, sex is being communicated as something that is easy and free with zero consequence. And guess what? In relationships, you can't trust nobody. So if you do get married, guess what? You could peace out and quit anytime. That's the education of the world. But you want to know there's an equally pervasive and also dangerous messaging that has come out from the church. 
and I rarely hear this being spoken about. And please note, I did not say the messaging comes from Christ. The messaging has come from the Capital C Church. Let's talk about the messaging that we have been fed over the last 20 years. What is the church's view and messaging by and large, grossly oversimplifying, is a high-end purity culture, which has damaged and hurt a lot of people. Um, if you grew up as a product of the late 90s or early uh, 2000s, keep in mind, psychologically and also historically, the people that were uh, explored, exploring sexual liberation out of the 60s and 70s began having children, and their children were going buck wild. So the church's response was to swing the pendulum from one side of crazy sexual liberation to a completely other side of conservative subculture. Books like I Kissed Dating Goodbye, Lady in Waiting, we used words like courting, and all of this was very, very nebulous. But what was being, con what was being communicated was that sex and the topic of sex was taboo. And only certain people would discuss those things and those were not good church folk. In fact, uh, sex was only for procreation, not recreation. What do you mean, sex isn't fun? No, sex is for families, all right? That's what happens. <laughs> You keep your legs crossed and you don't have sex. You don't even look at a guy, all right? Because he could get pregnant by looking at a guy. <laughs> Wear a t-shirt over your bathing suit not to stumble a guy, but the guys can be shirtless and nobody cares. Like, girls aren't going to get stumbled. Is anyone going to talk about that? Let's talk about the fact that as sexual created human beings with urges and drives, we are told keep everything unlocked. You cannot be a sexual person. You have to keep everything like a tightly lit faucet. But when you get married, you just open up that faucet and you're going to be a sex nymph that knows how to do everything. Where, where is good education coming from? But once you say I do, I think Christianity has been posed, well, part A goes into part B and you'll be okay. No, no, no. Sex was spoken about in ways that things missionaries did, if you get what I'm saying, and the holy bed was unsanctified with the lights off. That's been really hard education. Well, what about dating? Oh, no, no, Christians don't date. We do courting, okay? With books like I Kiss Dating Goodbye, Lady in Waiting, we developed language um, that, and here's the thing, truth. If you believe in courting, you believe in more of a traditional sense of dating, I applaud you. But I want you to get to that point with your own conviction and your own understanding of scripture, not because someone told you to. And we're putting like one big massive band-aid on a gaping womb, expecting everyone to get it and be okay. No. So you might be sitting here, might be new to church, and you were like, courting? What's courting? Courting is just this uber conservative concept and idea, which, hey, if you like it, do it. But courting is the concept and idea that you just wait for the one. <laughs> And when they find you and when your eyes meet, you are going to pray that the Lord part the heavens and his angels descend to sing songs over you to say, that is the one. And after 2.5 seconds of dating, you say, you are my Proverbs 31 woman and you are my Boaz. And two seconds later, y'all are married and pregnant and wondering what happened. Did you spend time to get to know them, to woo them, to fall in love with each other? Because let me tell you something again, I said it earlier, if you don't get dating right before you're married, you will not get dating right after you're married. Date your mate. After two seconds, you are like bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, I shall call you my woman, okay? And then also in dating within Christian context, you can't date and break up because then if you're a man, you're a sheep in wolf's clothing. All right, keep the women away from this guy. As if we can't make decisions to figure out this was not the best fit for me. Or if you're a girl and you break up with a guy, God, heaven forbid, you date two different guys at two different times, but you break up with both of them. <gasps> She's a Jezebel. We have gotten dating really, really confusing. And the reason I'm passionate about this is because I'm the chief of sinners to awkward dating and being a weird Christian. My phrase, it's weird if you're weird, came because I'm weird, all right? I met my husband on eHarmony. And um, I was, my sister paid for it because I was like, I've seen Dateline, How to Catch a Predator. I'm gonna end up dead in a ditch because I met this guy online. And I met Matt and he asked me for coffee and I said yes, but then I low key freaked out because I was like, I can't meet somebody online. This is so weird. I believe that God can bring me my Boaz. I believe that I could be fashioned from the, his side and I'm his rib and just so weird. And so the day that we were supposed to meet up and go for coffee, 
I told him I had an emergency and I did, but it was kind of like a Rahab lie, you know, where it was kind of true, but kind of not true. And I said, my mom is in the hospital, which she was, she had a doctor's appointment. And, <laughs> but I use it as a really good example to be like, you know what? I am a believer of Jesus and there is a call upon my life and I know that God has destined somebody for me and I just don't think it's through the traditional mode of online dating. So I wish you the best. God bless you. Goodbye. To which my level-headed husband of German descent wrote back very verbose. He said, no problem, dot, dot, dot. It was just coffee. To which I was like, did I get punked? Oh my gosh, I'm weird. I'm weird, it's me. I was the problem. Do you understand that if we don't put guardrails around Christian dating and have honest conversation, we're gonna continue to be weird. What about what the church has taught us and portrayed about marriage? Can I be honest? The church has made marriage an idol. The church has made marriage the gold medal for those who are good and godly. I'm going to tell you something as a woman who loves and serves God. I'm going to tell you something as someone, a woman who is passionately in love with her husband. I want to tell you something as a woman who will gasp her last dying breath being married to Matt Oltoff, whether he wants to or not. And I will tell you, marriage isn't easy. Marriage is very hard. And marriage is not the, pri the prize for being the right one. The evil, stupid, pervasive lie that sex is enjoyable before marriage and bad after marriage, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And the enemy knows, Satan knows that God's gift to us is, is, is in the marital act of sex. So why wouldn't the enemy want to put an assault on that? Why wouldn't the messaging of the enemy pre-marriage say, have sex, have sex, have sex, and then you get married and the messaging from the enemy is, don't have sex, don't have sex, don't have sex, you don't want it. No, 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 no. God's, one of God's beautiful, amazing gifts for us is sexual marital union between a husband and a wife. And of course, the, the enemy is going to assault that. So the book that we are studying, it's actually, it's actually a very large poem. And we call it a book. Uh, it was actually a poem written by King Solomon, who is the son of King David. And King Solomon was one of the wisest men of the ancient world. And this song was written between a man and a woman, scholars believe to be Solomon and his wife, Abishah. And theologians uh, believe that this poem was written in retrospect. It was like a couple looking at the beginning, the middle, and the end of their marriage over their life. And as I was preparing for this message, I realized something as I was combing over the pages of scripture that one of the greatest musical songs was written by a woman by the name of Celine Dion. And thank you, TikTok, for making her a superstar all over again. But some of you will know that there is a remake on TikTok circulating around, and it is of this song, It's All Coming Back to Me. So I want you to hear the interlude of the French Canadian woman. Celine Dion, and she has these lines, these beautiful lines throughout the song, and uh, there, there were moments of gold and flashes of light. She's alluding to the passion of the song, but as I was reading Song of Songs, I could not help but be like, oh my gosh, I hear the interlude of Celine Dion all over this. In fact, your optional homework this week is to read SOS chapters one and two, and you'll see the intimate language and the physicality of this couple. And as you do, I want you to think of the high, interesting voice of Celine, where she says, when you touch me like this, and you hold me like that, it was so long ago, but it's all coming back to me. I want you to hear that interlude as you read this, because that's what I hear in my head, all right? There were flashes of gold, and there were flashes of light. So let's talk about this book, and why is it called the Song of Songs? Well, some translators listed this as the Song of Solomon, but if you go back to the original context, nay, au contraire, me a more, it is Song of Songs. For us to get a little bit of context, context, most of us are familiar with the phrase King of Kings. Well, what does that mean? 
It means that that our God is the king above every single king of humanity. That if you were to pluck every king out of human history, line them up, then our God supersedes that by so much. So when we say that something of something, it indicates that there is nothing that can compare with it. So scripture has listed this as a song of songs. There's a lot of songs in the Old Testament. Songs when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. Songs when David and Barak, or excuse me, Deborah and Barak, conquered the Canaanites, songs of David slaying Goliath, songs of Hannah when she gets a baby in her womb after long, many years of waiting for a baby. Those were not the song of songs. This one is the song of songs. And what are they describing? What are the authors describing? A sexual relationship between a couple. And the Bible doesn't celebrate this physical union and say, it's a powerful human experience. The scripture doesn't say, oh, no, this is a pleasurable human experience. The Bible doesn't say this is a celebrated human experience. No. By saying song of songs, it is a celebration beyond all other things. So I'll let you know in advance. In the upcoming series, um, there's going to be a session that's dedicated to sex. I'll tell you that because some of you like to bring your kids in here, but it's called Rated All for a reason. All right. So I'm just going to let you know in advance. And in that session, I want to talk about some of the sexual analogies behind the word uses that are used here to describe sex in very creative ways. Also talked about how sex's ability can create human life. We talk about the pleasures that two bodies could feel in a fallen world. We'll talk about the spiritual connection that's fostered in the act of sex, that there's actually a brain rewiring that happens during sex so that you could celebrate and desire the person that you're having sex with. There is no other human experience like the song of all songs. So this book is all entirely about love sex conflict and marriage so you should be in song of songs chapter one and we're going to pick up in verse two and this is a foundation this is just a little appetizer this is an intro to give us a peek into this book it starts off with the woman speaking and she says let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is more delightful Ooh, than what church Okay, so in Hebrew, the, the word for kiss and kissing, um, it, it's, a, it's actually the sound of kissing in the same way that the word moo, M-O-O, imitates the sound of a cow. So this is going to be a description. It's not a technical treatise. It's a central retelling of a relationship between this couple. And there's this repetitive phrase, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Well, that might sound redundant because what else is he going to kiss you with? It's not until you realize that his kissing will involve his mouth, but her body. Ooh, I do declare, clutch your pearls, church. We're about to have a grown folk conversation. And why, why does she want this? She wants her husband to keep kissing her because there is no higher pleasure that she's experiencing in her life. The Hebrew word of a husband's love and what he is doing right now is the Hebrew word dod, D-O-D. And it is not um, a romantic relationship. It's actually sexual interaction. And she is saying that his oral caress is better than wine. Now, before you think up, she a turn up girl trying to hit the bottle. Ah, love me wine. No, 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 no. We have to have some cultural context. We need a little bit of Hebrew history to explain the astonishing power that this woman just said, this statement, we got to go back to 3,000 years ago. And let's talk about pleasures that we have today. You want to, let's think about simple pleasures. They're in the desert. She has no AC. She's in the desert. She's not sleeping on a bed. She's sleeping on a blanket or a mat. Let's talk about our pleasures. At any moment, we can roll up to Starbucks and get a frappuccino with extra whipped cream and sprinkles, and we have these daily delights. For me, for me, oh gosh, Matt gave me the best Christmas present. Uh, he knows I love deep tissue massages. He got me a 90-minute deep tissue massage where they go in and they wiggle your baby toe all around. Like, that's the kind of massage I want. I want them to massage my scalp. And what she is essentially saying, your love is better than the greatest thing I could ever pleasure. Because during that time, they didn't have chocolate or air conditioning or spa days. No, 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 no. Back then, the one pleasure 
was wine. To the ancient woman, to the ancient people, nothing was celebrated more than wine, except in this case, for a creative, compassionate, loving husband to be intimate with. So when the, when the reader of that time, the reader of that time, or dare I say the we, readers of today, when she says that your kisses are better than wine, that would have stopped the reader in their track because they didn't, ha they didn't have what we have today. So maybe you don't like wine. That's okay. Think of your absolute favorite thing. And she's saying, whatever your absolute favorite thing is, oh, your love is so much better. So get it like in your mind like a movie. We have a husband rolling in with a glass of wine and her wife, his wife sees him and says, put down the glass of wine and come kiss me. Come make out with me. Come passionately kiss me. That's what she's saying. So the Bible's book on sex begins with a woman's confession that her highest pleasure in life is being kissed all over by her husband. Now, you know what I love about this book? This book that is written in holy scripture, this book that is God kissed and God ordained is that this song says that sex isn't just for the husband or even primarily for the man. And I think so much of conversations have been that this is to please one person, one a gender. And there was a whole, a whole movement out of World War II where Brits and the English were told, lay there and think of the queen. And I think that has matriculated into our marriages that somehow sex is something not to be enjoyed, but to be endured. And the first person that speaks about sexual pleasure is the wife. Did y'all catch that? The Bible celebrates and sanctifies pleasures that this woman gets from sex. But this is not a one-way street. Uh-uh. We see in a healthy marriage, in a healthy marriage, both people make it their goal and ambition to satisfy each other romantically and sexually. So if you don't believe me, let's look at the reciprocity that we see in SOS 1 verse 9. Jump down a few verses. Now this is the man speaking. He says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Who doesn't want to be compared to a horse? Right, women? Is there nothing better? Again, these words are written 3,000 years ago. Uh, but to so the readers of that time, they would have known, oh, Pharaoh's chariots. They would have been pulled by the strongest Egyptian stallions. Well, during this time, there was some entrepreneurial hustler Egyptian horse groomers and trainers that realized if they get a mare, a female horse, among the Egyptian stallions, oh, the Egyptian stallions go up in a flurry, that even the scent of a female horse around these male horses would give us a real understanding of what horsepower really means. You know what I'm saying, okay? This is what he is comparing her to. So in Song, in Song of Songs 1-9, it presents a picture who glories in his wife's sensuality and assures her that her presence, ooh, her beauty, her desirability works in their relationship. Yeah. Christians, Christians, we should lead the way in this. Yeah. We have a God who has celebrated sanctified sex. We worship a God who says enjoy his creation. And since God created sex, it should be something that is enjoyed, not just endured. Yeah. But marriage is the necessary context for sex. And a lot of our education has kind of put that detail on the outside. I want to be very clear. Scripture is very clear, intimated and direct about sex being saved for marriage. So a, a naked spouse presenting himself or herself to their spouse in privacy is something to be beautiful. Be it's beautiful. It's desirable. It, it's part of God's creation. But you see a naked person walking in the airport and you think they're emotionally and mentally disturbed. See, context is everything. And sex out of context can make a beautiful thing become an agent of destruction. So the biblical context for a flourishing sex life. You want to have a good sex life? Scripture says that it's within the context of marriage and love. And since God is a God of love, we know that healthy acts of sex must be rooted in love and governed in love. And that tells us a lot about our God. Our God cares about relationships and intimacy. Our God is the kind of God that approves pleasure that feels transcendent. We can clearly know and love God, then we can clearly and accurately see and understand what sex is and the power of sex. 
when we accurately see and understand sex, then we could freely enjoy it. And as we uh, dive into God's word over the course of this series, uh, sex in marriage is not only God's plan, but it's also his gift to us. And so while the world is shouting, oh, while out, while out, and the church is saying, stay in, stay in, don't do anything, just stay in. The question I'm asking is, how do we live? How do we move forward? How do we do relationships well? This series is entitled Rated R, not just because of the topics that we're going to discuss or the adult theme nature of it, but we want to address romance, relationships, and religion. Why? Because those are parts of relationships that can feel really messy in our life. So where do we begin? I believe it starts by acknowledging the lies that we've believed. So much of our education has been formulated on hearsay, poor training, what so-and-so said, what you learned behind the locker room, what you saw in pornography. And I know that I may have not been the person to hurt you, but I believe that there's many people in this room, in the video experience and watching online, who need to know and hear that someone is sorry. For those who've had your innocence stolen from you at a very young age because you didn't think it was worth much, I'm sorry. For those who've been told the message of church that if you make a mistake and you lose your purity, then you're like a rose with the petals falling off and you're thrown like the immoral woman in John chapter four at the feet of humanity to be trampled on like rubbish. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for those who go to sleep at night and feel so lonely because your decision is to honor God with your body. I'm sorry for those who waited to have sex until marriage and your sex life is unfulfilled. I'm sorry for those in here who are experiencing marriages that are broken. I'm sorry for those in here who've experienced infidelity in their marriage and though they may, are, may be back together, there's still a distrust and a lack of unity. I'm sorry that we've ingested messages of guilt and shame and secrecy around topics like relationships, love, religion, and sex. I'm sorry for those that have been sexually molested and sexually abused. I'm sorry for the broken trust and promises that were robbed from you. But this is what I believe. Here in the house of God, in this series, I'm declaring that we serve a God who could redeem. We serve a God who can restore. We serve a God who can renew. We serve a God that can bring streams of living water through desert seasons of life. That's what we believe. But I believe that it's going to have to require us to do some work and make an honest assessment of where we are, what we believe, and how we've been educated for good or for bad. Spirit of living God, we invite you into this space in this place. Will you have your way? Will you wash our minds? the things that we have heard, the things that we have seen, the things that we've believed, whether it was communicated with good intent or malintent, whether it was from church folk or carnal friends, God, I pray that you restore our minds, you restore our hearts, you restore our marriages. Will you do a work in our lives and in this church? Oh, King of Kings, mighty God, there is none like you. Teach us through Song of Songs what relationships could be. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.